Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. I direct a research lab at MIT called the Self-Assembly Lab. And the way that I got into this actually is through architecture. And then I started to study software. This is one of the earliest CAD tools. It's 1953, I believe, Sutherland Sketchpad, which has its contemporary counterparts in sophisticated computational uh, software tools, simulation tools, analysis. It allows us to design things that we couldn't have designed before. And I don't think anyone here would argue with the fact that software has radically changed how we design, what we can design, and what we can imagine. That's almost nothing new at this point. But there's a similar story with digital fabrication. This is one of the first CNC machines at MIT in the 1950s where they, they combined a computer with a machine to mill. But that has its contemporary counterparts in multi-material 3D printing, laser cutters, water jets, CNC routers, et cetera. And there's a similar story. It's almost nothing new at this point that digital fabrication radically changes what we can produce. It radically changes what we can design and what we can make. But my research lab actually starts after that. What happens after we have software? What happens after we have digital fabrication? It's much like this. It's slamming things together. This is sort of the state of the art in construction and manufacturing. You have lots of parts, and you have lots of people or expensive robots, lots of energy, and you force things together. There's none of the elegance that we have in software and digital fabrication. It's brute force assembly. And so my research lab is trying to find ways that we can bring all the digital properties that we've become used to, like logic, reconfiguration, error correction, copy paste, sensors, actuators, all of that capability, and we're trying to embed them into the materials themselves. How can we have materials that can sense, that can actuate, and have computational logic? And if we can embed them in the materials, we think that we can then address these large-scale systems, these large-scale processes that we live with every day. If you look at every other scale, if you look at quantum to nano to micro, you skip over the human scale, and then you look at astro scales, like how planets are formed, how cells are formed. Every one of those processes happens through bottom-up organization. So you have a bunch of components. Those components relate to one another, respond to their environment, and assemble things, like humans are built that way. But at the human scale, we build from the top down, which is really strange. We take a bunch of parts, we have this brilliant idea, and we force them together from the top down. And so my research lab really tries to question that. What if we built from the bottom up at our human scale? Is there a way to take components, add energy, and allow those components to build themselves into precise, useful, functional things in manufacturing or construction? One of the most clear demonstrations is a project that we did with a molecular biologist. This is Arthur Olson. Uh, it's a polio virus. So you shake the flask hard, and all the parts break. And then you shake it a little bit softer, and they come back together. So there's no human interaction here. I'm not guiding it. I'm not jumping it in a very specific way. I'm shaking it randomly. There's no robot here. All of the construction information, the blueprints, are in the parts. So we're providing noisy, random energy to produce non-random, precise structures. We've done all sorts of research here. We've done research at small scales, at large scales, in different environments like fluid tanks and shaking, tumbling. But one of my favorite ones is this large-scale example. We used weather balloons, 36-inch diameter or a meter diameter weather balloons with Velcro nodes. And these, these weather balloons assemble in the airspace above the courtyard.
So this project proposed a quite radical scenario that we could have components, we can throw them into the air, and those components could assemble themselves in the airspace above a construction site, whether that's an urban setting where it's hard to get people and machines, or that's a remote setting where it's hard to get materials, hard to get machines. You could have materials that assemble in the air, and as the helium dies, then the structures then come to, come to the ground, all of the balloons are taken out, and you have a large space frame or a lattice structure. So all of this stuff is quite radical. This is what we consider our basic or our fundamental research. We're trying to ask big questions, see what's possible, understand how we can scale it, understand the ingredients. And what I'm gonna show you now is much more applied. This research is, rather than focusing on materials and how they can assemble themselves, we're focusing on materials and how they can transform themselves. How can materials change shape, change property, or act as sensors or actuators? This is what we call programmable materials. We first got started in a project called 4D printing. So 4D printing was a collaboration between Stratasys and Autodesk. And we wanted to take 3D printing and add the element of time to print things that transform or change shape, change property over time. So it's sort of like printing robots. That there's no wires, no motors, no electronics, but they have the behavior of robots. Or it's like printing smart materials but you can customize those smart materials. You can produce your own smart material to be smart in whatever way you want, to sense the environment in whatever way you want and transform in useful ways. So the way that we do that is we multi-material print. We deposit different materials at the same time. The easy one to see here is the black material. The black material is just a rigid polymer. And to us, this is the braille. It's the geometric information. It's the angles, the backbone, the precision. It's the joints. It's telling it how to go from one shape to another shape. And the other material that's a little bit harder to see here is a hydrogel. This hydrogel is swelling when it meets moisture. And when you combine the swelling properties and the ability to sense moisture in the environment with all the precision and the joints and the backbone, you can get it to transform in useful ways. So we've done all sorts of uh, research here, single strands that go into cubes, single strands that fold into the letters MIT, surfaces that transform into truncated octahedron, flat sheets that go into curved crease origami, flat sheets that expand and contract to do double curvature, or even 50 foot long strands that fold in an Olympic swimming pool like proteins. We've studied all different configurations to go from 1D to 2D, 1D to 3D, 2D to 3D, all different configurations geometrically that respond to moisture and transform from any one shape to any other shape. We've printed proteins that have all the joints and can transform on their own. But one major question kept coming up. How do we do this without printing and without printed plastics? Can we do this with any material? Can we do this with any industrial process? Because a lot of companies started coming and saying, can we do it for shoes, planes, cars, clothing, medical devices? And the answer broadly is yes, but it's nuanced. Every material is different and every industrial process is different. And so we've then started a much larger uh, research agenda, which is on this programmable materials. So programmable materials is trying to program materials to behave like the 4D printing, but with other industrial processes. And it's now a large collaboration with product designers and mathematicians, computer scientists, material suppliers, software companies. And we've done everything from printed wood. So literally, this is wood. We print the wood. It's much like an MDF, a sawdust and polymer. And by printing it, you get control over the grain direction. So you have all the properties of wood. It responds to moisture but then it can transform itself, folding, curling, twisting, looking like uh, fish scales, for example. Another example is textiles, and there's a lot of ways to activate the textiles. In this case, we pre-stretch, so we take the textile, pre-stretch it, print a different pattern, or bond it, or spray it with a pattern, and it jumps into shape, sort of like a jack-in-the-box. So you can get pleating and tufting and all sorts of different mechanical transformations without any manual labor. This is a heat active textile, textile that's opening and closing based on heat, which is the same way that we do it with carbon fiber, Kevlar, and fiberglass. We take a flexible composite, we print an active polymer, and it can fold, curl, twist in useful ways. All of these materials are responding to temperature, moisture, or in this case, light. So the materials have no sensors, no electronics, no motors, and they're responding to their environment in useful and predictable ways. One collaboration that's quite near to all of us here is a collaboration we've had with uh, Airbus. 
And this is an interesting application for some of the carbon fiber work. So we started to look at the, the top of the engine. If you're sitting on the plane window and you look out, there's a hole in the engine. And this hole is cooling the engine, but it causes drag. So the, moral, the normal solution would be to add an electromechanical flap, just like the wings. So add motors and electronics and sensors to open and close. But the problem that adds cost, that adds weight, and it adds extra assembly time. So we started to develop a scenario where we have a single sheet of carbon fiber. That single sheet of carbon fiber is super light, super strong, as you already know from carbon fiber, but now it can transform. So that material is slowly opening and closing to control the airflow without any electronics, any actuators, et cetera. In this case, it's opening and closing based on the temperature from ground to 30,000 feet. And then more recently, we did one on pressure differential from wind speed. After activating with temperature and moisture, we then started to look at weaving structures. So the braided or woven structures, how can you use that structure to create transformation? And we've done all sorts of large scale ones, a couple meter scale uh, to many meters. This is a, a 20 foot scale one. We're load testing it, measuring the dynamics. And then you'll see an even larger one in a second, which is uh, a 20 meter. So this one, you can see the small person at the bottom. This is a large woven structure, and you can imagine like the fuselage of a plane or the building structure, large scale uh, materials that are behaving like light textiles. They're able to transform in unusual ways that normally large scale structures can't do. A very specific example that we collaborated recently with Google on is a pop-up structure. This is really challenging the pop-up space uh, in an office. So imagine that you have a cubicle or you have an open office plan. They both have constraints. Can you have spaces that transform in really subtle ways to create privacy in some moments or to create open environments for uh, people to move through or to have meetings? So one last topic that I'm going to focus on is not about assembly, not about programming materials, but about phase change. How can you get things to transform in phase, so flexibility to stiffness? How can you get something to go from solid to liquid? And specifically, we look at a topic called granular jamming. Granular jamming is, sounds really weird, but when you go to the grocery store and you buy coffee and it's really, really hard, that's granular jamming. The particles are jammed. They're stuck because you pull a vacuum on them and they don't have anywhere to go, so they act like a solid. But then you can reverse it. You can pour it and make it a liquid. If you pull a vacuum, you make it a solid again. So we've done a, an interesting take on this with a collaboration at ETH Zurich, or Mazio Kohler's group, where we take rocks and string, and we can make a sort of reversible concrete. So this project's called Rock Print, where literally we're printing with rocks and string. We have a big bounding box, the yellow structure, and we lay rocks and string, rocks and string, rocks and string, over and over and over again. There's no adhesive, no binder, and when you remove the bounding box, all of the rocks fall away that did not have the string, and only the rocks with the string jam. So they act like a solid structure. You can put three tons on top of this. It's fully load-bearing with no adhesive, no binders, no connections. It's literally loose rocks and loose string. And here you'll see how we reverse it. So if you just literally wind up that string, you can make fully reversible concrete-like materials. So the benefit of concrete is that it's a liquid. You can pour the liquid. But the problem with concrete is two things. Number one, the lead time. So concrete takes a long time to cure. And that's one of the leading contributors to cost and construction time, is that you have to wait for the concrete to cure. So you can't keep building until it's solid. In this case, you pour it, and it's instantly solid. But when you reverse it, it becomes 100% recyclable. So if you make a concrete structure today, and you can't really reuse it, because when you knock it down, it's useless. In this case, we can just disintegrate it, take all the rocks and string, and produce another structure. So it's a reversible, instantly curable concrete. So where is all this crazy stuff going? To me, this image is the state of the art. This is still how we build buildings, phones, shoes, cars, planes. It's lots of materials, lots of people, lots of energy, and we're forcing these things together. And there's really only two solutions today. One solution is to try to find cheaper labor so we can follow around the map, around the world, and try to find high, highly skilled, cheaper and cheaper labor. The other one is pure automation, that we can have cheaper and cheaper, more highly skilled, highly precise robots. 
but we're proposing an alternative. We're saying that maybe there's another way. Maybe that materials, on the one hand, can be robots. So materials are sensors, materials are actuators, and materials have logic. So the materials are the robots. And on the other hand, we're saying materials can collaborate with robots. That if you have these highly skilled robots, they can deposit materials, and they can learn from those materials as sensors, as actuators. They can take information from those materials and potentially build better things. So we believe today we program computers and machines, and tomorrow we'll program matter itself. Thanks so much.